In a church I served a number of years ago, I was following a pastor who had been the senior minister there for nearly 40 years. There had been an interim time, and then though that pastor and the pastor's spouse had reconnected with the congregation, so he's worshiping there, and while I was there, he died. And so we were to have a memorial, funeral service. And he had been, of course, in that church and in that community for nearly four decades. So we knew there were going to be a lot of people. And so there was a team of people. This was not an infrastructure already in place. A team of people who volunteered to host the reception. And it was going to be a lot of work for a lot of people. And they did a beautiful job. They created centerpieces. They served the beverages and the food with a real sense of hospitality, of kindness, of compassion. And toward the end of the reception, I'd walk back into the kitchen where already some were starting to do the cleaning up. And I just, I thanked them for what they had done. And I said to the woman who, who headed up the team, I said something like, thank you so much for shining God's light to this family and this community. I really appreciate your ministry. And she looked distressed by my words. She said, ministry? And later she followed up and told me that she had struggled most of her life with a sense of not being good enough. These were messages she got from early childhood. And so the idea of her shining God's light, of engaging ministry, she said, that just felt above my pay grade. <laughs> and I've experienced that in people from time to time where there's a sense of I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy to somehow be part of what God's doing in the world. And then maybe on the other end of the spectrum, there's sometimes maybe people who've experienced the same kind of challenge or trauma in their childhood, but they've had a different strategy to deal with it. Sometimes people will say, I don't need anybody or anything, and they're more the controlling. Maybe they bully a little bit. Uh, but they try to manage everything, and, and so they don't think of themselves necessarily as shining God's light or doing ministry, because they don't need anyone to do anything. It's a DIY kind of life. And I mention that because people of both spectrums and everywhere in between can always be part of faith communities. And the ways that people, though, can see that or believe that they're not able to be part of what God's doing, Jesus did not see it that way. Jesus did not see it that way at all. Jesus really lived and believed that no matter who you are, where you are on the journey, you could be part of embodying the reign of God's justice, love, healing, and hope. And he invited people who were considered the anybodies and the nobodies to be part of that movement. And he also invited people who were seen as the elites and the educated and the scholars. They were more likely to reject him. But he was inviting everyone to be part of what God was doing. He believed it could be everybody and anybody who could be radiant with God's healing and love and justice and light in the world. And our story today is a reminder of that. And I am really thankful. There are certain stories that we hear every single year, if we're you know, regular worshiper people, and this is one of them. Now, as a pastor who's been ordained for 30 years, there's sometimes, there's certain stories you're like, again? Huh, do you have something new to say? But there are others... There are others like this one where it always feels like there's so much that the story is speaking into our own time and place. In the story, we hear that Jesus is taking three of his followers up to a mountaintop. And when Jesus is taking the apprentices, the disciples, that's usually the point is he's going to teach them something, show them something. And so we can expect that there's some teaching moment that's going to happen here. Now, the mountaintop in in the Judaism of Israel, but also we see it in other faith traditions and spiritual traditions. Mountaintops often represent for folks the divine and human coming together, the earthly and heavenly intersecting, because after all, the earth is reaching up and scraping the heavens, right from the perspective of people looking at mountains. So we see that as a metaphor. So going up the mountain, well, there's an anticipation that something of God and human might come together on a mountaintop, metaphorically. And we're told they're not going up for a picnic or just to admire the scenery, to check out the snow on Mount Lemon with every other person in the city of Tucson. <laughs> they're going, Luke tells us explicitly, to pray. And a reminder, we've talked about this before, 
but that prayer from the perspective of Jesus is not petitioning a reluctant God to do what God should already be doing. And prayer is not mouthing a few words hoping that God will take care of stuff above our heads or against our will, hashtag thoughts and prayer. The prayer for Jesus is about opening fully to divine wisdom, presence, and energy, and living it in the world. It is the intersection of human and divine, the heaven and earth coming together. The prayer we pray each week, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in the heavens. It's bringing it together. So Jesus, on a mountaintop with his disciples, to pray, this is the narration setting us up for a potent experience of the divine and human coming together. And sure enough, it does in the story. Shine, Jesus, shine. Jesus on the mountaintop so fully open to God's presence and power that he is radiant with the divine, radiant with God's mercy, justice, love, all of the goodness shining forth from Jesus. Paul talks about veiled and unveiled. There's often the sense that that image, that idea is veiled from us. Well, Jesus has so opened to God, the veil is taken away. And then we also have Moses and Elijah there. They're dead. In case you didn't know. They didn't climb with them or just pop out from behind the rocks. So there is this idea in the story that I've talked about before. All heaven breaks loose. Jesus praying on the mountaintop, all heaven breaks loose. And you know, we already know what it looks like and feels like when all hell breaks loose. So all heaven breaking loose sounds good. Jesus is showing, how do you, how do you unloose heaven? How do you open up to God's presence and energy and life? And so all this is happening on the mountaintop. Shine, Jesus, shine. Moses and Elijah representing the law and the prophets, the full of the Torah and the teaching, the tradition that Jesus and his disciples are part of. And what's happening with the disciples? They went up to the mountain. They went up to pray. Are they shining too? Are they? No. No. Did you hear why? They're sleeping. Slumped over with sleep. So they had good intentions, right? They went up the mountain. They intended to pray. But Luke's telling us they drifted off. Now, of course, with literal sleep, that happens, and then we miss things. Some of you may be experiencing that right this moment. (laughs) Or, you know, when you're with a partner or spouse, and it's getting late, and you're both in bed, and someone's talking, and then it's the jab. Are you listening to me? drifting off. But it's also, I think, a metaphor for all the ways that we drift off, that we might mean well, we want to pay attention, but we drift off. And a good hint for me about this is that Peter, James, and John, who are, it seems in the Gospels, the inner, inner circle, maybe Jesus's best buds, that they also are invited to go pray with him another place, that we're about to hit Lent, Well, at the end of the Lenten story, there's another chance where Peter, James, and John are to pray with Jesus, and we're told they fall asleep. But that story says they were heavy with grief. And I think there's a compassionate understanding. It's not like, oh, you schmucks, how dare you fall asleep, but rather we get weighed down with all the distress, with grief, with trauma, with fear. We get weighed down. We may want to be part of what God's doing with attention, but we get distracted. Well, they're awake enough to catch the brightness in Jesus. So although they're not necessarily absorbing and shining it yet themselves, they catch it in Jesus. And then Peter, true to his character in the gospel stories, comes up with his own plan. And though good for Peter, he at least names it. It's not a secret plan. He just starts babbling it out loud, as the the message version of the story put it. So Peter, his plan... We've got all heaven breaking loose. Let's create some structure and some order here. Let's capture the moment. And there's lots of ways I can think to read this, that out of this potent spiritual experience, Peter wants to just build a little monument to it. Or maybe out of the potent spiritual experience, and certainly church history bears this out, that there is, well, we had this powerful experience. God is here Let's form some committees and create a constitution and bylaws so that we will have structure to make sure we can keep this going in some form or way. Or I think now, and I would be guilty of this, that Peter, it's a bit like he stepped forward 
and turned his camera around and kneeled and got a selfie with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And then while whatever's happening, he's working on editing the photo and making a great social media post. <laughs> well, what all that, whatever Peter's doing, he's missing the point. He's missing the boat. And God doesn't want that for him. And I think that one of the reasons the naming it out loud is Peter stays open to dialogue, to hearing how God is still speaking. And we hear that this light radiant cloud, this cloud overshadows Peter. And we've seen clouds in the scripture before or overshadowing or hovering over. Right from Genesis 1, the Spirit of God moves over the chaos and starts creating. Or God's Spirit moves over the Red Sea and makes a way from slavery to freedom. That Mary is told that she can birth life that will transform the world. And she's told, how's this going to be? The Spirit overshadows you. Moses on a mountaintop in a cloud experiences God's word and wisdom and comes out shining. And I think about... Yesterday, I went to the top of a small mountain, and it was socked in with clouds. And I noticed, though, that I still had different perspective. So normally, I'd be standing up there looking all around. Isn't this glorious and gorgeous? But instead, it was socked in. And so it had me paying attention to different things. So I wonder, was Peter just distracted, off kilter? And so there's a sense of God's like, we'll make it a little cloudy for you. So you can wake up, in a sense. Pay attention to something different. And then the feel of the story is, though, like God's interrupting Peter. He's like, we're going to build this, and everyone pose, and God's like, shush. Peter, this is my son, the one who's embodying what I want in the world. Listen to him. Your job isn't try to figure it out on your own or capture the moment. Your job is to keep listening to him, to, which means to follow him. And then you, Peter, you're going to shine too. And I need this from you. I need this radiant love, healing, hope, and justice. I need you to carry that into the valleys. And afterwards, there's a story that says they do. It's not supposed to just be, oh, isn't this cool on the mountaintop? Those experiences are to be lived in the valleys, in the everyday. And so I appreciate this reminder as we enter into the Lenten season, this reminder that we are all meant to shine. But it doesn't happen against our will or over our heads. There's our part. And we drift off, we get weighed down. But there's the invitation to put ourselves, not literally, but metaphorically, in our mountaintop places. Where are the places where you can be more free of distraction? Where are the places where you can focus or pay attention or really deeply listen? The invitation to keep putting yourself in those places. It's even better if you can do it with some friends. There's a sense of God's voice amplified in community. But to make that the practice, to make that the intention, that we receive that light, that we will shine it. The woman I was telling you about at the beginning of the message, about a year later she was participating in a meditation class we were doing at the church. And she shared about her experience with the class later. But in this one particular meditation practice, there was the invitation to pray a question, and the question was, who does God say that I am? And there was a, a mantra and a meditative practice that went with the question. Well, she reported that at first, as she's sitting there, she's just like, who cares, and I don't know, and just kind of rolling her eyes and thinking of all the stuff she needed to do. But there was some ample time to just be in that silence, and she said eventually, this thought came into her mind. It was very clear at the time. And the thought was this, you are my beloved daughter, with you I am well pleased. And she said her initial response was, oh heck no. <laughs> she felt afraid. And she said, this might be a good time to use the bathroom. She wanted to just get up to kind of push it away, because it was making her uncomfortable. But she decided to stick with the practice, to just seeing it as an experiment, and she sat there with that for a while. And she said, it's like it started to sink in a little bit. And when she returned to the, the full group, as she first sat down, she was with a friend she'd known for 20 years. And she sat down next to her friend but as everyone was kind of moving back into the, the sharing space. And her friend leaned over and she said, I don't know what just happened for you in that meditation, but you're kind of glowing. And this woman later, a few years later, she became a hospice volunteer working with an AIDS ministry in our community. She had found this place of a gift and a way
to shine, the woman who before thought she had nothing to offer or nothing to give. You are shiny people. It's the truth of who we are, made in the very image of God. And there's a lot of shadow in the world, from genocide in Gaza to just hearing about along our own border, how the border patrol was leaving people to freeze and arresting Samaritans who were trying to help them get to safety. That happened just miles from here, just the other night in the midst of this cold winter. They're the shadows of our own illness and dis-ease in our own bodies, not working the way we want them to, in our own families. We know trauma and drama. There are shadows everywhere, but there is light. There is light available to us and that can be in us and shine through us. And so we are reminded, whether we think ourselves at the moment unworthy or we're a little bit full of ourselves, that Jesus says, I see light in you. Open to it. Receive it daily so that you can shine it. You are the body of Christ. You are Jesus in the world. So shine, Jesus, shine. Amen.